All right, welcome back to the podcast. I am joined today with Paul Molyneux. He is a registered nurse in the UK, and he is going to be talking about his experience of depersonalization, derealization disorder, which he had for about two years. He has written up, um, you know, I get, I get people that reach out to me and I ask them, hey, write something up. And he put together this killer review on depersonalization, derealization that I have on my website, psychiatrypodcast.com. He also has a um, uh, kind of a nursing level coaching uh, that he provides at www.thedpguidancecenter.co.uk. Um, and he is someone who has read the hardcore literature on this. He has summarized it in our document. So today you're going to get a treat. We don't know as mental health professionals a lot about depersonalization, derealization. I don't remember one single grand rounds that I've ever heard on this. Um, I've read some articles because of personal interest and I've treated the patients mostly um, coming off of marijuana. Uh, who have this. I've had a number of patients who also suffer from like panic disorder or like OCD who have this um, at times, or I've had a couple of patients with psychosis who have had this sort of description of the uh, dissociation um, like thing that they're describing where they do not feel con- like they themselves are real or the world around them is real. So depersonalization. I do not feel real. Derealization, the world does not feel real. So welcome to the podcast, Paul. Hey, great to be here. Thank you for having me. I was thinking maybe we could start by reading that um, Pretty Pimpin' by Kurt Vile that from the, the lyrics. Yeah, it's a, it's a really, really amazing song. I, I think I, uh, I read it on a Reddit forum about people who were listing songs about kind of dissociation and this one kind of came up. It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing song. Um, sort of a real kind of piece of Americana. Uh, so it sort of says, I woke up this morning, didn't recognize the man in the mirror. Then I laughed and I said, oh, silly me, that's just me. And I proceeded to brush some tr- strangers' teeth, but they were my teeth and I was weightless, just quivering like some leaf coming in the window of the restroom. Um, so the whole song appears to be about this kind of person that kind of doesn't recognize themselves, even when they look at themselves in the mirror, which is very evocative of them. Um, of that kind of depersonalization experience yeah then i proceeded to brush some stranger's teeth but they were my teeth and i was weightless exactly. that weightlessness and the dissociation um it's very common quivering just quivering like some leaf come in the window of a restroom it's like this kind of like weightless feeling this disconnection from your body He's doing right. things to his body that he doesn't feel like are his own body. Yeah. I mean, I would I would love to get the background as why he wrote that song. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, it must be something going, going on in maybe his experience, I, I suppose. Yeah. So it, it, um, let's just begin with how common it is for someone to have maybe a little bit of this, you know? Like maybe not the full disorder, but just a little bit of an experience of depersonalization, derealization. It's actually probably more common than you may think. Um, I mean, there was a study which I think uh, was over in the US, which um, uh, telephoned um, um, individuals up and asked them, "Have you had an experience of kind of depersonalization, derealization last year?" And around a quarter of people said that they they did. Um, so this is a far from rare, um, rare experience that people are having, um, and a lifetime prevalence. I mean, this is this is towards the higher end of um, of studies around kind of prevalence over the course of a lifetime, but they get to being as high as around seventy percent. So we may think of this as being a very strange, a very unusual experience, but in fact, it appears to be a relatively common experience that people have. And we may place this perhaps on a spectrum, like we may do other mental health symptoms where um, where people have it just as part of their normal experience, a reaction to stress or fatigue or whatever. 
Um, mm-hmm. They have it kind of sporadically, and then you have the kind of disordered end of the spectrum where people have this more kind of persistently and um, problematically. We could talk yes. about this later, but it's not necessarily a problematic experience. It doesn't. It's not an inherently problematic experience. Mm. Yeah, it's um, it's often associated with the fatigue, the stress, substance use, and what you're saying from this from these studies is that it's a common experience that someone might have this fleetingly for a couple hours, for a day or two. That's fairly common. Maybe we could start with what is the diagnostic criteria for depersonalization, derealization? You know, take us through the DSM-5 um, and where we are today with this, with the yeah. name. So, I mean, pr- previously the DSM-4 used to refer to it as um, depersonalization disorder, but it's now referred to as depersonalization derealization disorder in DSM-5, which I think better than it than kind of encapsulates what this, what this disorder is. D- depersonalization is this kind of subjective sense of feeling in some way kind of disconnected from oneself, which can manifest itself in kind of several different ways. So, for example, people may feel disconnected from the reflection in the mirror, so they may not recognize themselves in the mirror, or they, it may feel as though it's somebody else looking back at them. Or when they look down at their hands, it may feel like it might as well be kind of somebody else's hands that they're looking down upon. People may feel in some way disconnected from their own emotions or thoughts, so they feel the emotion, they have the thoughts, but they might as well be kind of somebody else's thoughts or emotions. It's almost like they are a kind of a passive observer to um, to these experiences. Movements may feel automated or like the, the movement of an automaton. People may feel, this is something I definitely kind of res- resonated with, um, with with my own experience of, of the disorder is I would walk into a room that would be very familiar to me. So, for example, my my bedroom that I grew up in at home and I'd visit my parents at home. And whilst I knew the room was my childhood bedroom, it didn't feel that way. It just felt completely felt disconnected and kind of numb towards it, no emotions towards that room. And and people can have this experience of almost like an out of body experience where they may feel like they're watching themselves from outside themselves in some way. So this p this depersonalization is this subjective sense of feeling in some way detached from oneself. Derealization, I think, is a little bit easier to explain. The derealization is this kind of subjective sense of feeling in some way disconnected from one's kind of surroundings. So reality may take on a kind of uh, unreal, foggy, kind of lifeless or dreamlike quality to it, which can be kind of very disturbing for um, for individuals. And so, I mean, the primary criterion in the DSM-5 is that you must have uh, one or the other or both of these experiences, depersonalization and derealization, uh in a kind of persistent and recurrent um fashion so it wouldn't be kind of an episode it would need to be a a, a persistent episode of this disorder or a recurrent episode of the um these experiences yeah so depersonalization unreality detachment being an observer with respect to one's thoughts feelings sensations body or actions like these perceptual altercations, distorted sense of time, unreal or absent self, emotion or physical numbing, right? And then derealization is the uh, experiences of unreality or detachment with respect to the surroundings. So derealization is like your like reality is, uh, it's like this, detachment i like how you said it's like that numb or dreamlike or foggy or visually distorted so when you you had it you had it for like two years um yes which of these did you have the most depersonalization or derealization would you say 
so, so for me, the primary and uh, the most distressing symptom was this sense that reality just felt, I felt like I was watching a movie of my life. So reality just felt like I was watching a film uh, or that I was in a dream. And I, I felt as though as almost like a pane of glass had been placed in front of me and reality. It was a very, very strange sensation to uh, to experience. So my, my primary symptom was was that. A kind of a, what a lot that came along for the ride was these this kind of depersonalization. And like I said, like I'd go into very familiar rooms and I would just feel completely detached from these rooms, like I'd never been in them before, for example, in my childhood bedroom. And also I'd kind of feel very distant from my um from my reflection when I looked at it in the mirror and my hands felt just as though they may be somebody else's hands. Um all kind of really, really distressing symptoms to mm. have or i found them extremely distressing and so you said um it started with a panic attack at some point you had like a panic attack and then it kind of progressed into this so yeah so I, I yeah i, I mean I, I guess um i suppose i was vulnerable to this disorder because for as long as i can remember for whatever reason i've always had this kind of episodic experience of this feeling of unreality so when i was a child if it was a very very hot day a very kind of bright day i'd have this experience of derealization mm. and it would come and then it would go and it was unproblematic uh up until kind of sort of 2006 2007 and i was experiencing panic attacks and we obviously kind of know that um these kind of dissociative experiences kind of come along for the ride when people have panic attacks. And I kind of got really latched onto this, this symptom, this specific symptom of a panic attack. Um, I then had had a panic attack and the realization was part of that. And then after the panic subsided, the derealization kind of remained um, and kind of remained with me for the next kind of two, two years. Oh, wow. And just just so we can kind of more understand this um how old were you when this happened uh about uh 21 21 okay yeah, 2021 yeah was there um any substances associated with the pa initial panic attacks or initial no no how i mean that, that, a lot of people for this disorder i think you've alluded to in your introduction um will have a smoke of some weed or another drug uh, they will experience panic during that experience and the drug may bring on a dissociative kind of element to it um and after the kind of weed is out the system or the, the drug is out the system people will the depersonalization derealization will remain so for some people, it can be substance use, which is their kind of vehicle towards this disorder. For other people, it can be kind of panic. And for other people, it can kind of be kind of other reasons that may be more, more kind of insidious and just kind of it creeps upon people slowly. So ever since you can remember, you've you've had dissociated episodes or dissociation episodes. Um, yes. And then how long would they last when you were a kid were they like a couple minutes or a couple of minutes a couple of minutes yeah i mean maybe maybe kind of half, half an hour i'd guess i mean it's in, it's actually interesting because i recently had a, a conversation with an auntie of mine who's uh kind of in her 70s and she says that she also has these experiences as well um and, and has had them for a very long time so i, I my suspicion here is that i have a perhaps a, a genetic vulnerability to to this um uh, and then kind of other factors later on in my life kind of led to this becoming a disorder mm -hmm. yeah and then any like other medical things like migraines or seizures or anything like that no so, i mean so it's, it's kind of interesting you say that because uh, it is true to say that these symptoms can be part of a physical illness or diagnosis. So one of the diagnostic criteria the DSM sets out is that these experiences should not be due to another physical, physiological kind of reason. So for example, it's with temporal lobe epilepsy, people with migraine, people with 
head injuries like concussion and kind of post-viral symptoms. So we see a lot of people with kind of COVID um, mm-hmm. who who describe this kind of uh, foggy oh, yeah. brain kind of yeah. sensation. So in in making a diagnosis, you'd want to rule out those factors um, because if it's attributable to those factors, then you wouldn't make meet the criteria for the diagnosis. Yeah, I felt I felt some of that after, for about a week or two after COVID. I just felt like I was like, yeah, like a walking zombie. You just did not. Yeah, I did not feel myself. You know. And yeah, I know. I know some people. I've seen a couple of people who have that like long COVID and they, they have that continued, you know, experience of like not feeling back to normal, not feeling themselves. Yeah. And, um, therapy and, uh, different, different treatments, sometimes creative one, one patient I had start cold plunge and that was what did it for her. She does it every morning for like five minutes. She goes in the, a river near her house it's, she lives in a cold area and that just it's, kind of like does something to her that gets her out of it so it's but, extremely interesting you say that i've got a colleague who had long covid and she does the same thing and that's what helps her is she goes swimming in a very cold lake <laughs> yeah do it do it with a friend if you haven't done it before um and i never put my head under water unless i have like someone there who can pull me out uh I, I do I do it for got, like 10, 10 seconds, but I don't want to black out, you know. <laughs> like you've got if, more air guts than me. <laughs> if I have a friend, I'll go under I'll put my head under for a minute. Um anyways, it's it's like weightlifting, exercise, getting back into life, you know, that kind of stuff as well. Commonly recommend therapy. I run an IOP partial. We've had a couple of patients with long COVID who are on these like you know, medications that just haven't worked like ivermectin or something like that. And then just a lot of therapy seems to be what got them back to normal. Um, A lot of group therapy. And, and and so I imagine that they might have a depersonalization experience. Yeah. hundred percent. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So I think, I think most people can imagine a time where they felt dissociative. And so, you know, if you, and also I would say the very nature of trauma is to dissociate. Like, I don't know if it's a real trauma unless you actually dissociated in the midst of the trauma. For me, you might not remember the moment of dissociation, but it's very common to dissociate in the moment of the trauma or surrounding the trauma or talking about the trauma. Like a lot of yeah. my my experience when I'm talking to people about trauma, about the trauma that they actually went through is you can feel like they get more disconnected from their body. They feel more lightheaded. They feel numb. You know, they talk different. They talk a little bit softer. Um, This is dissociation. This is, it's, it's like the body's defense against something really hard. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, it's, I suppose when you're looking at, um, people undergoing kind of traumatic experiences or very difficult experiences, we often talk about the fight or flight response. Obviously, people may be um, involved in a car accident and need to get out the car wreck. You get that fight or flight response going. That 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 gets them out of the car wreck because they have the kind of surge of adrenaline going around the body and you know the increased kind of um, oxygen uptake, etc. Um, th- there is the other response to trauma, which is the freeze response. So this is this idea of almost kind of playing dead. Yep. Um, and I suppose part of the freeze response is that allows us to freeze and allows us to, I suppose, play dead is to dissociate. So it's an, it can be an adaptive strategy, for example, in a situation where I I can't fight or flight my way out of the situation, it can actually be highly adaptive for me to be highly attentive of what's going on around me, but for me to at the same time disconnect. So I might fit, might feel emotionally numb, um, and, and in some way disconnected from what's going on around me as well, um, which may allow me to survive the whatever it is, the assault or the attack or whatever's going on around me. So. Um, I suppose the, the fight or flight response is kind of this well understood and well 
often patients will come to me knowing fully what the fight or flight response is, but they generally haven't heard of the freeze response. And it's the freeze response that kind of is very much associated with these kind of um, dissociative symptoms. Yeah, I um, completely agree. I would I would add one little thing that I've noticed is that the fight um, f- the fight and flight response tends to happen. Um, it, it's more yeah, it's that sympathetic nervous system. The sometimes there'll be a like a pause in the fight and flight response where they're surveying the surroundings. It's a hyper vigilant space. Um, that's not the freeze response. So you'll see, you know, like if a, a wild animal is sensing danger, they will get very still and they'll look around, but they're still ready and mobilized for action. Right. Yeah. Um, the freeze response, this immobility, the shutdown, um, which, you know, if you, if you look at like child abuse or adult sexual assaults, I would say the majority report a high level of paralysis, like 88% in child abuse, 75% adult sexual assaults report a moderate to high level of paralysis. And, um, I would say it, everyone has the capacity to do it. So for example, David Livingston, there's a famous quote. He said he got attacked by a lion and he, he froze up and he said it, it caused a sort of dreaminess in which there was no sense of pain nor feeling of terror, though quite conscious of all that was happening. And so we know in that sort of immobility, shutdown, dissociation, we have decreased activity in the brain, decreased activity in the right anterior insula, which is where we have interoceptive awareness, decreased activity in the anterior cingulate cortex, which integrates bodily responses with behavioral demands and with emotional awareness. So the parts of the body that are sensing, like our, our, you know, where our body is positioned, what it feels like to have your feet on the ground, that part is actually tuning down in this shutdown, in this immobility. Um, And so we go from the fight and flight and when it's unsuccessful, when we feel like there's no hope, we go into the shutdown place. And so I'm curious if you see this as kind of like where people get stuck for a prolonged period of time in this depersonalization, derealization, like, are we talking about the same thing here? Different manifestations of this sort of shutdown. What do you think? One of the theories behind why this disorder happens is, um, or what I suppose one of the neurobiological explanations is they found that people with this disorder have this kind of dec- uh, sorry, increased prefrontal cortex activity. And, this, and that pre- increase in prefrontal cortex activity shuts down parts of the limbic system or part or shuts down the limbic system. It has an inhibitory effect on the limbic system, um, which can leave people feeling this kind of very emotionally dead state, which is what people will describe with this disorder, at the same time as feeling highly attentive to the surroundings so one of the theories is that this is why the kind of disorder sort of, it, 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 I guess, emerges or or can emerge, or one of the neurobiological explanations. Th- there is a cognitive behavioral model of the disorder as well, which suggests that people, I mean, look, if you're involved in a very traumatic incident and you experience this, I suppose, this freeze response or this dissociated response, you may say to yourself, look, I'm feeling this way because I've been through some trauma and what you know once I've settled down this this uh, depersonalization, this derealization will go. What the cognitive behavior model suggests actually is that for some people they become fixed on this symptom and they insert a catastrophic a, a narrative, a catastrophic appraisal. So they may say to themselves, I've been through this traumatic instance. I'm feeling this very strange way. Perhaps this is a sign that I'm going mad. Or perhaps this is a sign that the trauma has done something bad to my brain that I can never return from. That then creates 
a cycle in which the individual experiences more anxiety because of the catastrophic appraisal. That that increased anxiety then creates more depersonalization and derealization, and then people go round and round and round on that loop. Um, so that's one of the explanations to the disorder that depersonalization, derealization is is a common experience to have and will be particularly common after a traumatic incident. What um, for some people it's they insert a catastrophic appraisal about what that means, and that's why they then develop the disorder. Your emphasis on that, and my emphasis on that, and repeating that this this idea that you have people have a dissociated a dissociated experience a derealization experience it's the appraisal of that dissociation which really changes the nature of it long term because you could have a lot of fear about that appraisal yes. um you could think and i i think it's helpful to maybe move away and broaden this to, to all sorts of physical symptoms we have like if you have um a back spasm after you do some squats or deadlifting and you imagine like this like idea of like oh i'm bone on bone or i'm like gonna be harmed forever that attribution will change how much spasm and the the feeling of the spasms and the pain with the spasms how long the spasms are there. I know this because after weightlifting for a number of years, now when I feel it, I'm just like, oh, it's a back spasm. Yes. And I it's like just move on. It's a back spasm and it goes away, right? Um it's the same thing with like uh heart palpitations. Like let's say you had heart palpitations and you're like attributing some incredibly high meaning of like future pain and distress. Like this this palpitation is going to give is is atrial let's you know is is going to give me a stroke or it's going to give me this you know i know because i i've, I've gone into like afib a couple times in my life and i've had heart palpitations and it's like at first when i had it i had this incredible fear about strokes because that's what i knew right i went and yeah. saw a cardiologist and said look at your age at your physical health you your risk of stroke is the same as anyone your age it's very low. And immediately the, the meaning changed, you know, Yes. or I had um, heart palpitations for a while and I thought it was AFib, but it wasn't AFib. It was just pre premature contractions, high stress, high, high cortisol levels. You know, I had this cardiologist friend that I lifted with and he was just about 10 times. He told me, dude, you're going to be okay. It's going to, it's like nothing. It's like, I see this all the time. It's, it's it, his anxiety level about it was so low because it was like such not a big deal for him, right? Yes. And it changed my meaning of it. And the meaning, the, having the meaning change made the actual thing decrease. Absolutely. Or I just like didn't even care if it happened, you know? So hopefully that theme of like the, the value attribution that we put to things and put to this symptom of dissociation depersonalization, derealization uh, is so important, right? Yeah, 100%. I mean, the model, the cognitive behavioral model, this is developed by a, a psychologist called Dr. Elaine Hunter, who's based in the UK, and her colleagues. I mean, the cognitive behavioral model relies heavily on the, the, the panic disorder model, really. You know, with people with panic disorder, like you're kind of saying, they get a heart palpitation, most people may say, oh, that's just me, I fl my heart fluttering or, or it's, it's, I'm, I'm stressed or whatever. Um, the person who goes on to de develop kind of panic disorder says, oh, this is terrible. I'm I'm going to have a heart attack. Uh, that obviously then kind of increases anxiety, which increases the, the chance of them, you know, having, a, having more heart flutters or makes them hyper aware of their heart, those kind of things. So it's kind of creates this kind of cycle. And, and this is what the um, the personalization uh, disorder, cognitive behavior model relies heavy on, which is this idea of this appraisal. How does the individual uh, who is experiencing this dissociative symptom appraise what's going on for them? 
if they phrase it as something regular, something kind of normal in inverted commas, that it's just that they're tired or it's just that they've gone through, um, I, I don't know, a bad experience with a, with, a, with a drug, then as the situational factor reduces, so does the dissociation. For the people who go on to develop this as a disorder, they insert this catastrophic narrative, which is what I did. So I became convinced that I'm experiencing this symptom. That must be a sign that I've done some irreversible damage to my brain. Clearly, that appraisal is going to make me more anxious because there's very little I can do about it. It's something that's happening to me. It's permanent damage to my brain. There's no going back from this. Clearly, I'm going to become more anxious. What happens when we become anxious? We're more likely to dissociate. So we end up in that kind of just cycle, just going around and around and around and around. Yeah. Okay. So even before the CBT model of this, I would go to, I would go way back in history to Marcus Aurelius, right? Roman emperor. He's, he, here's a couple quotes. Pain is not due to the thing itself, but your own estimate of it. And this, you have the power to revoke at any moment. Here's another quote. If you are distressed by an external thing, it is not this thing that disturbs you, but your own judgment about it. And it is in your power to wipe out that judgment now. You know, and so it's like, it's your estimation of this thing that's happening to you that you actually have some power over. And I would say for for dissociation, my theory on someone like you who's a little bit more prone to dissociation, which by the way, I am as well. Like even as a kid, I could tell you memories like where I dissociated different, different things. I think they tend to be higher affective empathy and higher trait openness. And maybe, and, and I would say it's, it's almost like the, the patients that I have who are three standard deviations above the mean and openness tend to dissociate more easily. It's what do you think? And I, I know this I because the, I actually do the I actually do the the big five on most of my patients. Okay. So if you want, I'll run it on you so you can see what you do. Uh, but, absolutely, yeah. You you have more experience to this than I do, yeah. The third thing I would say is neuroticism. I, I tend to see patients who are higher neuroticism, they get stressed out more easily to things. Yes. Yes. Um, but it seems that it's it's like the high openness people. It's like those are the people that you know, the artists, right? The people who are more creative, naturally, high openness, high creativity, um, and then high affective empathy because they feel so intensely other people's emotions. So cognitive empathy is you can you can tell someone what they feel, you can read them, but you, you may not feel it, you know? So you can be a psychopath and have no affective empathy and have normal cognitive empathy because you've learned it through society and watching people and becoming a keen observer of people notice i throw in keen there isn't that interesting that's that's a word i usually don't use um maybe because i'm talking to you (laughs) i don't know do they use that in the uk keen what do you mean by that we we, like uh is that like a normal word that gets thrown in there yeah if you're keen on something you like it a lot yeah yeah that's funny so it's also the name of a really bad band (laughs) Oh, that's so okay. So they have um people with high affective empathy feel into other people's experience more commonly. So you're a psych nurse, you probably have higher affective empathy, you care about people, you see people suffering, you want to help them, right? And so because I'm very high affective empathy, when someone's dissociating in front of me, like I will feel some of that dissociation when they're having a migraine in front of me, like I, my brain may start to hurt. I remember one person who had stabbing headaches and it's like, it would like come on all of a sudden. I remember like watching them like I am during the interview. And then all of a sudden, like my brain just jolted. And I was just like, what? And she's like, you, you could feel that. And I'm like, yeah, what was that? She's like, that's my stabbing headache. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's, that's awful. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so I'm, 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 I'm emphasizing alternative narratives that someone can have about having a dissociative experience, right? So instead of telling yourself, I'm going to die, this is always going to go on, this is horrible. It's 
it's a different narrative to think, oh, maybe I'm having this because I'm highly creative. I'm high stress reactivity. So when something does, something very stressful happens, I feel that stress and more intensely than most people, or I feel I'm just picking up more stimulus from the environment than most people. Like you, like the highly sensitive child yeah. is like someone like yourself who just is pulling in more stimulus than most people. Now, if you're someone who loves to go to Disneyland, like that level of stimulus is your cup of tea. You're not a highly sensitive child. Okay. Like you're, and you're not a child, but it's the, it's the person who's wired that way, right. Who's just pulls in more information and stuff from their environment that I think it can be overwhelming if they pull in too much, if they're having, so it's like a sensory diet is what we do with our kid, my kids, for example, where it's like, because me and me and my wife are both highly more on the higher sensitive spectrum. Our kids are just a, a, a beautiful mixture of that. And, uh, so for us, it's like nature It's like, we need more nature than most people. We need more downtime. We need more reading. You know, we need more of that sort of reflective space. So if you, so I'm, I'm putting out like an alternative narrative that someone can grab onto instead of the catastrophizing narrative. I mean, that, that is the, I mean, I, I really like that way. I've actually never heard of it being described like that, but that is a lovely counter narrative to, uh, to a catastrophic appraisal that somebody might be putting onto this um, condition. I, I mean, ultimately, I think what we're saying is that this is kind of, like I said at the beginning, this is a spectrum, isn't it? Like to be a human being really is to be somebody who has the ability to dissociate. So this isn't an inherent, although the individual with the disorder might be experiencing this as a negative experience, it's not an inherently negative experience. And in actual fact, it can actually be for some people, even an enjoyable or desired experience, um, which people are often surprised by, but you know, I used to work in drug and alcohol services for for a number of years, and we'd have people who would take uh, the drug ketamine. Ketamine is a dissociative drug; it brings about these experiences. So I was kind of like, you know, so there's people out there who are kind of paying a lot of money and risking getting arrested and risking, you know, life and limb to experience what I found out was a, a, I found to be a horrendous experience. We have people who experience kind of um, sort of transcendent, transcendent kind of religious experiences who as part of that experience, as part of the rituals, they will start to dissociate and they view that as a very positive thing. I know for me, myself, I have this ability to dissociate that I can bring on if, if I want, I used to run a, um, run ultra marathons for a few years and you know kind of at mile 45 of a 50 mile race it was kind of quite nice to just tune out for a little bit and numb myself to the pain so i suppose the the experience is a, is a human experience it is not inherently a negative experience in fact for some people it can be an entirely desired and wanted experience it's just for some people who go on to develop the disorder it's but unfortunately, it's that catastrophic appraisal that they put on it that I've done something wrong to my brain, I'm going mad, the weeds, you know, destroy my mind, whatever. Uh, that's what turns us into a disorder. Mm-hmm. Very interesting that you would, it would take you that many miles to get into the dissociation. Isn't that interesting? I mean, could you get well, into I, it after like five miles or was it half, did it have yeah, to be I, 40 miles? No, no, I can get, I mean, if I, think about it enough i can bring it on so oh, okay wow you know i can, and and it, it, to me as it so happens I, I when i when i experience it i just kind of say all oh, this i'm just experiencing this and then i concentrate on something else and it goes um but i use it as a little bit of a sort of a, a sixth sense so if i'm stressed or overly tired at work say i will go on to experience some dissociation Mm. I will simply say to myself, "I'm. This is a sign that I'm stressed and tired." So my um, reaction to that is not to do something about the dissociation; it's to do something about the stress and the tiredness. 
Good. And once I, once I sort out those factors, then the dissociation will just go. So I use it now as a, a sixth sense to guide whether I'm whether I need to do something about kind of um, you know stress levels. So it's a, it's a useful thing for me to have. Yeah, I think it's a really good. It's an alternative narrative, right? The narrative, the story Correct. that you're telling yourself. So I'm stressed and I'm tired. Therefore, I need to rest and uh, take care of myself. You know, absolutely. Um, I think these are really good narratives as well. Like if we have kids that are dysregulated, like let's say you have a kid and it's like this kid is in Disneyland. It's towards the end of the day and they're like just absolutely dysregulated. It's like that kid doesn't need a spanking. What they really need is less stimulus. Yeah. You know, it's like they need some nature. They need some healthy food. They need, um, you know, some comfort, right? Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's the narrative that we put on things. I'm thinking, I'm thinking as well. Like, yeah, I like the idea that there's gradients of dissociation. Like at the lowest level, I would say, you know, when you're driving home, if you forgot how you got halfway home because you were thinking about some podcast, like let's say you were listening to this podcast you just dissociate it. Like you exited yes. one part of your experience into another, other, another part of your experience. Yes. Um, come back to cold plunge. Sometimes I'll be suffering in the cold plunge and I'll start to post something on Instagram and just the focused ability to think about what I'm posting, to write it takes me completely out of the cold. So it's like, I can, one time I was in there for like nine minutes and I was like, wow, that's the longest I've ever been in there. Um, and so it's like, you know, that's another thing is like focus can take you out of some painful stimulus it's yes. dissociation. So that's one level of dissociation. Um, people who are smoking marijuana and they've smoked for years, I usually don't, I've had a, well, let me see. I've had one of those patients who all of a sudden started to react poorly to marijuana, worked well for years. And then all of a sudden it was awful. And he got completely off of marijuana. He came to see me. He was really struggling with it. And it was freaking him out. And you could see the fear and the attribution, right, of what this meant. Am I yes. going to be like this for the rest of my life? It's incredibly scary. And so if you're listening to this episode and that's where you are today, um, know that you are not alone. That's where a lot of people end up. And you you have so much pain that you're looking for a solution. And so you're listening to this because you've like Googled it. And now you're trying to figure out what do I do about this, right? 100%. 100%. I, I mean, like I said before, kind of weed is a very common vehicle by which people develop this disorder. Um, it usually involves some level of panic during an episode of, of weed use, of marijuana use. Um, which then brings about or intensifies the dissociative experience that people naturally have when they smoke weed. Um, it, it tends to be that then people put this catastrophic appraisal that the weed has done something to my brain. I've got so high that I've not I've not come down, or I can't come down, mm -hmm. and that then creates that kind of vicious loop that we talked about earlier of kind of increased anxiety and increased DP, uh, depersonalization. What was the um... Like, so, so you had it for two years. How did you exit out of it? Like, what was the journey for you specifically? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the background is that I was studying to be a psychiatric nurse at the time, um, which was a very challenging and kind of difficult experience. And I had several other kind of social stresses going on, sort of relationship difficulties and those things, which kind of were just feeding this situation in which I was becoming more and more anxious. And then obviously that creates more uh, opportunities for depersonalization and derealization. My, like I said, my theory was, look, there's no way out of this. I've got this permanently because I'm, I've had it 24-7 for almost two years. There's nothing I can do about it. I've got this brain disease effectively. And I didn't know what to do. So one day I just took myself off to um, the accident and emergency department and, um, 
uh, you call it something different in the US, you know, the, the emergency treatment department at the hospital. And um, I saw a, a practitioner there, a mental health practitioner there, who um, seemed to understand sort of what I was going through, but, you know, I don't think understood fully about this being a, a, a disorder. He sort of sent me on my way with, um, with I think, five milligrams of diazepam. And sort of unbeknownst to me, he rang my university up and said that Paul's attended the hospital. Um, I think, you know, you need to yeah, look, at, look to pull him off the course potentially. And I got a, a, a phone call from my tutor in the morning and she um, she said, right, look, you're going to come off this course just for a period whilst you get yourself sorted. So during that time, wait, a friend... It, yeah. Wait, j- just one thought on that. I mean, that feels like a yes. violation that he reached yes. out to the university like that yes in in america that would be like a huge hipaa violation um i I'm, felt I'm, angry yeah yeah now now as it so happened looking back that he did me a huge favor okay um so i came off the course for a period and uh just i was living with um, one of my best friends now a, a um, who's actually trained to be a clinical psychologist. And so he said, look, you're doing nothing. We're off this course. Why don't you come along to the gym with me and we'll go along to a spinning class together. So I have nothing to lose. So I go along to the spinning class. And the intense nature of that experience, so it was kind of a dark room. It had, it had like disco lights going. The like music was really loud. The trainer was kind of shouting at you, you know, come on, come on go faster, go harder on you know on the bike my heart rate going everything just for the 45 minutes that i was on the bike i didn't dissociate and i described that the spell was then broken my belief is i've done something permanent to my brain Mm. Uh, there's no going back from this i have this thing 24 7 i then go on a spinning bike and for 45 minutes i don't dissociate my belief that I've done something to my brain, it's permanent, is therefore disproven. And from then, over the course of a couple of months, I pieced together more and more periods where I didn't dissociate to kind of eventually make a, a time where I just didn't dissociate at all. Now, my narrative to myself afterwards, you know, the years afterwards, was that, look, the reason I got better was because I engaged in sport, I engaged in exercise. And, you know, to this day, I still engage in a lot of exercise. But actually, I've also realized that the practitioner who rang the university up and the university bringing me off the course, that actually just massively reduced my stress levels. Mm. So obviously, I wasn't having to attend lectures, I wasn't having to go on placement, I wasn't having to do essays and assignments, and I wasn't having to pretend to be normal. Uh, all that kind of reduced my stress levels enough that it kind of created this environment where I could start to recover and heal myself, and I did. And after about two or three months, I was then back on there, back on the course. That's good. Wow. Yeah, I think I think that first biking incident, you know, it it kind of took you out of that shutdown into the fight and flight, right? He's yelling, you're pushing yourself really hard. And then somehow the message in your brain was like, hey, you don't have to get stuck in that dissociated place. Like you got yourself out for a bit. That means you're not going to be stuck in there forever. Right. Um, you know, exercise is also a good treatment of anxiety and depression, you know, and so 100% it and decreasing the experience of stress or, you know, allowing you to be more resilient to stress. Um, I, I talk a lot about in the podcast, progressive exercise, thoughtfully progressive so that you can slowly raise the bar at which the amount of stress would lead to a dissociation, for example, um, or lead to other maybe less advantageous coping strategies. Although I think dissociation can be a a coping strategy from time to time. Like you said, a lot of people like to dissociate drinking alcohol. You kind of dissociate. It's like a happy trance or whatever. Um, People with borderline personality disorder, 
I, I have a theory that whenever they hit the hospital, they've usually been dissociating for a couple of weeks and jarring them out of that dissociation with meds doesn't take very many days. You know, someone with mania comes to the psychiatric hospital to get them out of mania takes seven to 10 days. Someone with borderline personality disorder, they can flip out of the dissociation, whatever suicidal funk they were in within a day or two. You know, I don't know if you've I mean, seen this. It's very interesting you say this because I went into this profession, you know, uh, now I work in a community mental health team where I'm day in, day out meeting up with people with borderline personality disorder. And, you know, obviously one of the diagnostic criteria is that people have... Um, kind of severe dissociative experiences right and i always thought well i'm going to speak to these kind of people are going to assess their symptoms they're going to tell me that they dissociate and i'm going to say that's really bad that you dissociate that must be really awful for you and in actual fact a lot of them would say to me no i really enjoy or not enjoy i really find that experience quite helpful because when i'm completely emotionally dysregulated then i'll dissociate and it'll just you know, I'll take a back seat to my emotions. So again, it's going back to this idea that actually it's not an inherently negative experience. Now that might be a maladaptive coping strategy for them. You know, there may be other better ways to cope with that emotional dysregulation, but for them, it's not perceived as a negative experience. I think going back to the kind of exercise side of things is a psychologist once said to me, look, the reason why the kind of exercise that you did was really helpful is that when you are exercising you that intensely, you literally cannot think past your next breath, mm. let yep. alone ponder about, you know, dissociating. Yeah. Um, there's, there's no opportunity, you know, I, I was Absolutely. a little bit kind of, a little bit so nervous and anxious about doing an interview here. Right. So mm -hmm. I, you know, thought well, what I'm going to do with my morning. So I go off to the gym and do a, a brisk walk on a treadmill and a, and a light run. You know, I don't, I'm not thinking about the uh, the interview. I'm just kind of thinking about one step in front of another. What's my breathing doing? You know, it just it just drags you out of those uh, those kind of negative thoughts that you have. Yep. Yeah, I did some uh, squatting, deadlifting this morning, and when you're deadlifting, there's nothing else in your brain. Other than 100%. like, other Pain. than I'm I'm lifting this thing up. I'm let's keep the technique good. You know, I don't yes. I don't know if I I don't feel pain. I don't think I feel pain, but I feel. Um, I mean, it's just like if I wasn't awake, now I'm awake. Like everything in my brain is awake when I dead. Like you know, it's it's. Well, I think even the anticipation of it, isn't it, that you you got this large weight to lift and you're nervous about potentially not being able to lift it and that kind of thing. So you're really kind of focusing on what I need to do, the technique, what does this look like. You're not I used, thinking I used about... to be like that, but not anymore. Like there was when I first started, I would say there were days when all I could think about was the workout at the end of the day. You know, like but yeah. but now I'm like, I just go do it. Don't think about it too much. I mean, it's, it's like, um, it's, it's almost boring, right. To some degree. And I think actually that is a good place to arrive. If you have depersonalization, derealization, it's like, it's, it's like to move from it's incredibly fearful to have this to it's like, it's boring to have this. Yes. Well, there's a degree, isn't it here? And this is, this runs across a lot of kind of therapies, isn't it? Is that actually our natural inclination is to fight. Is So we have these, whatever the mental health experience is, we don't like it, we fight it. And that just persists, make the disorder persists. And that actually kind of acceptance is maybe a good starting place for change to happen. Um the kind of analogy is, isn't it kind of like this sort of sinking sand analogy where uh, a quicksand sorry, analogy was if I'm sinking in quicksand, my natural inclination will be to wrestle and pull my way out of it and, mm -hmm. you know, try and wriggle out of it. And obviously that just makes me sink further. If I accept kind of where I am and if I just actually just lean back or lean forward and spread distribute my weight, therefore I don't sink any further. And um, kind of use it at that analogy with kind of service users and patient that actually to begin to recover, sometimes we need to accept where we're at. At least then we're not fighting. And I think that's the case with this disorder as well, that 
people find the derealization, depersonalization, a very distressing experience for whatever reason they do. Um, and their natural inclination is to fight it. The cognitive behavior model then suggests is that actually this fighting just creates more opportunity for this disorder to kind of take place because we may start to symptom check. So we may constantly be on the lookout for depersonal and derealization. Um, we may be constantly on the internet looking for answers about how to fix this thing. Um, we may engage in avoidance behavior. So we may just kind of shut ourselves off and not leave the bedroom. Um, we may pretend and act as though we're normal when we're kind of not feeling normal. And all these things, all these things do is just cr create um, more opportunity for this dissociation to become entrenched. Um, so that's a kind of second cycle. So you've got this initial uh, uh, cycle with the anxiety, the catastrophic narrative creates anxiety, and that creates more dissociation. The second kind of cognitive behavioral kind of cycle is a kind of maintenance loop where people engage in kind of behaviors which um, which just kind of prolong the, uh, the symptom. Hmm. Yeah, I had one patient who was spending about eight hours a day reading about his sub you know potential medical issues it was mostly anxiety that he had but he would spend yeah. about eight hours a day and um yeah so the loop if, if you're not if you haven't experienced this loop it can be big Huge. Um, I think you'll see you see kind of on um, you know i delve in and out of these kind of reddit forums okay got kind of depersonalization derealization reddits and it's just mm. it's literally just people expressing that they've got this thing and it's absolute hell and it's awful and they don't know what to do and then obviously people are just kind of reading this and then commenting on it and it's just you can tell people are just kind of obsessed with this kind of symptom and are kind of just looking for answers on the internet and it just must be so frustrating that the internet doesn't come up with like this oh you just take this pill and then you just say these words to yourself and then you recover <laughs> and so people just get more more and more frustrated with themselves and with the internet and with kind of life that they're experiencing this symptom which just creates more and more anxiety which creates more and more opportunity for depersonalization and derealization yeah sometimes um these forums and the facebook groups and you know it can become a place of venting of one upping each other's horribleness yes. of symptoms yes um and the self-help that is offered is oftentimes poor if any you know really, and, yeah, really and, poor yeah and so you can get stuck in this like loop um, i mean i i remember when i would first had this thing i thought well i'm going to go on a forum so i found a forum and i think the first thing i read was somebody saying that they had this thing for 14 years and i was like a month in <laughs> thinking 14 years <laughs> like and all that did was just create more anxiety and obviously the more anxiety i feel the more i dissociate yeah. so yeah it's, it's yeah so i'd say that if anybody's listening to this with the disorder my recommendation would be don't use the forums the only thing you should really be reading online is of people who have recovered from the disorder mm. um that's a um, good point recover you know recovery stories of which there's plenty of them out there yeah and I bet you get a lot of the people who haven't recovered posting the horrors of their experience. Partially, they want empathy. They want they're desperate. They're reaching out. They they want something to be able to help them. But well, there's, um, a, there's, a, there's a huge selection bias, isn't there? You know, those those people on the the forums are the people who haven't recovered. The people who have recovered aren't going on the forums. Right. I get a number of people who reach out to me, and they're like, "I want to come on your podcast and talk about how much I'm suffering." I'm like, well, are you have you recovered? They're like, no. And um, I'm like, well, then that wouldn't be a podcast interview. That would be me doing therapy, which <laughs> yeah. you know, you're not in my state. There's a time so and a place for that. Yeah, you should get a good therapist. You should be, and you know, the cognitive behavioral model. You know, there's studies on it, but I would say any good therapist should be able to help someone with this. I mean, I. I really think any therapist should be able to help. Any decent, you know, therapist should be, you know, and therapy takes time, right? So it's gonna, it's not gonna be a cure in one session. It's like, 
how long does it take most people to get out of like 75% of people get out of depression in like 50 sessions or something like that. It's like, it takes a while to get yeah. out. Yeah. Um, now, if you look at CBT for depression, you know, the big meta analysis just came out. The way that I read it was that about 20% more than placebo or the, the you know, weightless control got better. So 20% more is not a hundred percent, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 10 sessions is not going to be enough. And um, 12 sessions is not going to be enough for most people to get better. So it's a journey. Most people will invest to do the deeper work so that they can, they can get better, but it's, it's important to realize it's a, it's an investment. And it, that I think the number one reason why people don't go to therapy is they think it's going to be too expensive. You could look inside your insurance. If not, you could look at training programs. Young therapists are sometimes just as good as old therapists. Like it's like they're motivated to help. Um, and so getting getting into a a person that you can afford with your budget, I think is is obtainable for most people. Um, I know the the university I'm a part of, we even have like a county clinic that we participate in. And so people with the state level insurance can get therapy there. So it's available. You just have to be curious. You just have to look. Um, I had one patient even go, I, I don't know if I'd give this as advice, but they, they found a really good doctor overseas that was doing therapy over video. Yeah. And it was like a quarter of the price of what it would be in like the U S you know? So, okay. So psychotherapy, I think is very important. And yeah. Any other thoughts on psychotherapy before we move on to medications? So, yeah, I mean, I think, look, I think the cognitive behavioral model is, I mean, I, I believe this kind of explains why I suppose descended into this disorder. Yeah, I mean, in terms of kind of evidence, there is a trial, I think, from 2005, I think it is involving a, a reasonably small number of patients. It was an open label study, and they found that um, they had good success in treating the disorder using a cognitive behavioral approach. I am aware that the same team, I think, uh, are in the recruitment phase, I think, of a uh, another for another trial looking at um, cognitive behavioral therapy for this for this disorder. Um, and I think the results should be published around about 2024, 2025. So I'll um I'll I'll wait that uh I, I really wait excitedly for the results of that um of that study. So this 2005 open study involving 21 patients treated with CBT saw significant improvement in measures of dissociation, depression, anxiety, and general functioning, with 29% of the patients no longer meeting criteria for the diagnosis at the end of treatment. So it's kind of in line with what I said, like if you have shorter term treatment, CBT, 20%, 30% are going to get better. Okay. That being said, continue with treatment, right? 12 sessions is probably not enough. 20 sessions is probably not enough. Just continue. If you have a good provider that you feel you trust, that you can have increased ability to share things vulnerably with over time, I think that is sufficient to be helpful. Yeah. That being said, share this episode with your therapist and the on the psychiatrypodcast.com as well, we will have this article, which has all the links to the study. So your therapist can, if they, if they don't know much about depersonalization, derealization, that they can learn some, um, I would say that's part, part of what you could do to sort of help yourself out. If you're already seeing someone that you trust, um, you know, I think, I think you'll, you'll benefit from doing the deeper work. Okay, let's talk about psychopharm psychopharmacology. Um yeah. No FDA approved medications for this disorder. I think that's the first thing to start out with. And um there's a lot of smaller studies. Right. And I was reading through what you found and I think we should go through it just because it's 
it's good and we'll we'll link all these studies in the article so yeah where do you want to start yeah well i suppose just to reiterate yeah this is a little bit wild west in the sense that there isn't an algorithm that we're going to be able to give you here which says that if somebody presents with this disorder this should be what you prescribe first and then if that doesn't work this should be what you prescribe and um there was a study i think from the early 2000s in which the team that um who, who um, treat this disorder i think got 117 of their kind of service users their patients and basically said you know what treatments have you had before and you know has anything kind of worked so obviously people listed that they've had been on ssris and antipsychotics and, and anxiolytics and 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 whatnot and it wasn't found through that study although it's a very problematic study it wasn't found that there's any medication that particularly kind of kind of stuck out so i suppose that's the kind of background here uh in which we'll be talking about medications i mentioned um, this uh simon at all 2004 it was a double blind placebo controlled study involving 54 patients with dsm4 depersonalization disorder and they found that fluoxetine was no better than placebo so yeah so that so in terms of the antidepressants i mean that's the major trial uh involving antidepressants which is the ssri rightly you say the um, it was fluoxetine um now what they did find actually is that the patients in the fluoxetine group actually did improve more than the placebo group however when you controlled for the anxiety and depression or for anxiety and depression it actually it was the anxiety and depression that had actually improved now um what what they kind of sort of recognize is that actually some patients with the depersonalization just felt like they were less bothered by the depersonalization and what they actually say is that a win is a win right so um whether you've reduced the anxiety and depression and that reduces the dissociation in some way or just make somebody's life a little bit more manageable then it may be worthwhile trialing an ssri um for somebody with this disorder despite the fact we don't have a very robust kind of evidence base to um uh, in which we might be able to suggest that this is a very effective medication i would caveat the ssri use uh which thing I mentioned in the article, which is obviously some patients can experience this kind of numbing effect with SSRIs, um, which may exacerbate some of the symptoms that um, uh, that people experience with this disorder. So I think perhaps judicious use of these medications may be may be called for. So they, um, I'm I'm just looking at the study, and they said finally a categorical analysis of responder status reveals a 24% response rate on fluoxetine and a 20% response rate on placebo. <laughs> the the p-value being 0.73, so there's no difference between those three or two uh, two categories. Um, which is not hopeful for me. I mean, as a provider, and I see that, it's like I'm not going to reach like unless I'm trying to treat the anxiety and the depression, like why would I use yes. that? Well, I think I've, I guess in terms of the other antidepressants, that's I mean the MAO, MAOIs. There's no evidence to suggest these are effective. I mean, there's just there's nothing other than there's one study uh, from I think 1989, a case study which suggested that uh, an MAOI was effective in treating a individual with depression who had a kind of depersonalization element to the depression um the tricyclics there's a little bit more evidence in the tricyclics so there is a case study uh from the 80s which suggested that dyspramine uh treated primary depersonalization disorder well and then uh the individuals who did the study on fluoxetine also did a the study um that trialed clomipramine against imipramine um this only involved um i think seven patients um now two of those patients who completed the clomipramine phase of that trial um actually had a very um, good response to um clomipramine and i think it was noted that i think when one individual tried to come off the clomipramine the um 
your depersonalization returned. So, I mean, there is a long established link between um, sort of de depersonalization disorder and OCD in that some people can really kind of be just constantly symptom checking. They can be kind of almost tortured by obsessional thoughts around existential thinking and those kind of things. Um, and obviously, clomipramine, although it's not kind of a first line treatment for OCD, it is an established treatment for OCD. So it may be for a subset of individuals. Um, clomipramine might be useful or might be useful as an alternative to people who can't tolerate the SSRIs due to that kind of um, that kind of numbing effect. Not not incredibly excited um, about the pharmacotherapy in terms of what we've discussed so far. Uh, what about it doesn't get much better but uh... <laughs> yeah it's the... and you know the the problem is is that these are small studies um like a case study an individual study it's not like you can like really control for spontaneously getting better getting better for other reasons you know having it be like a placebo response so you know, it, the, we have to be a little bit guarded with yeah. those types of studies. Yeah, we we'll keep, keep keep going. What else? What else are you finding? I think the medication probably most associated with this disorder is, as being um, something that may be effective is lamotrigine. So, in the reasons behind this are kind of quite interesting. So, for um, for individuals who you give ketamine to. Um, if I mean ketamine is a dissociative drug, I think it increases glutamate transmission. If you pre-treat those individuals with lamotrigine, the evidence suggests that you get a decrease in dissociative symptoms. So it kind of makes sense that um, this a medication might be effective in treating depersonalization and derealization. And the evidence is kind of really quite nuanced, shall we say? Uh, so the team in London here in 2003, they um, conducted a double-blind placebo-controlled crossover trial involving um, nine patients. They sadly saw no benefit when this was used in a, as a monotherapy. Um, the same team have conducted some open-label studies um, and what they noticed is that um, there was a, a 50 to 70 percent, or is it effective in 50 percent, 70 percent of patients when it was used kind of concurrently with an antidepressant, particularly an SSRI. Um, so there might be kind of some scope to marry lamotrigine with an SSRI. Now, when I said the evidence is kind of nuanced, um, it's kind of really nuanced because in 2011 there was a trial involving 80 patients. I think this was in Azerbaijan. 80 patients where they used lamotrigine as a monotherapy for the treatment of depersonalization derealization disorder. And they found that there was a good response. Um, and they defined a good response and adequate response as a, as a fifty percent reduction on uh, one of the on a, one of the uh, rating scales, and they noticed yeah there was a significant response uh, for the patients treated with lamotrigine. Sadly, the article has been retracted because in fact they've plagiarized a large volume of text, um, so that has been retracted now. I understand that the data was not questioned. It was the plagiarism that was questioned. How I would, I would say that actually, if they 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 really did kind of sloppily kind of just plagiarize a large body of text. So if they've kind of been been sloppy in in that, then what else have they kind of cut corners in? So I think, um, yeah. So that's a real problematic uh, problematic study. Now, in terms of the kind of dosages, what the team in London noted was that um, you there's potentially you really need to kind of maximise that dose of lamotrigine, um, and I think they were treating people up to six hundred milligrams a day with lamotrigine. Um, so, if lamotrigine is going to be used, um, 
you may wish to kind of really kind of maximize that dose obviously taking into account kind of um uh the tolerability of the medication yeah i i've used lamotrigine a little bit with dissociation some people it seems to help um like the cyclothymia the people with the the ups and the downs of the mood it can be helpful there's always the risk of Stephen Johnson syndrome yeah but it does not cause weight gain um I still I still vote for therapy and exercise primarily um and then thinking about treating comorbid things okay yeah any other meta medication groups you want to mention yeah so I mean the other interesting one is the opioid um antagonists um again mechanistically this might make sense is when you give somebody an opiate obviously people experience this kind of emotional kind of numbing effect um and obviously this is kind of why people take it this kind of this kind of pain-free state that people kind of get into um which is particularly it's been noted when you give somebody a, um an opioid antagonist particularly an antagonist of the kappa receptor that uh in kind of studies have noticed that people experience depersonalization and derealization so it kind of mechanistically might make sense that you may see a reduction in dissociation or emotional numbing if you initiate an opioid an opioid antagonist um in 2001, there's a Russian study which was single-blind, placebo-controlled, involving 14 patients, although not all of those patients had depersonalization disorder. Um, they noticed there was a 71% reduction in symptoms when individuals were treated with naloxone, with three achieving complete remission. Um, I mean, obviously, naloxone is the agent we typically use to reverse opioid overdose um so it's kind of um uh, not a kind of long-lasting medication and uh, i think it has to be administered kind of intramuscularly or intravenously so yeah so uh further trials and have involved naltrexone which is the kind of oral or oral opioid um antagonist so there's a couple of trials of interest one 2005 open label trial involving 14 patients um, treated with a dose of around 120 milligrams a day, they noted that there was a 30% reduction in symptoms of the personalization and derealization. Mm -hmm. um, and a more recent trial involving naltrexone, it's a German study with 15 patients. They used low dose naltrexone to dosages of around two to six milligrams a day with 15 patients. Not, not they weren't specifically treating depersonalization, derealization disorder. They were treating dissociation, and um, they noted that there was an improvement in symptoms of um, depersonalization and, de and derealization in the um, in the patients that they treated. Uh, they noted that uh, eleven patients had a lasting. Uh, uh, sorry, they noticed a reduction in 11 patients in dissociative symptoms and a lasting effect in seven. And they did report specifically to um, to positive reductions in depersonalization and derealization. More studies needed. This is this is the theme. This That's, is the theme. Yeah, that my my response. To this is more studies needed. You know, and if you're um, if you're a provider using medications, you know you you have to comment like look there's just very little data to support much being used and yeah therapy and therapy and exercise probably i would say i would more supported still but okay yeah and then antipsychotics very thin we don't need to the, the studies yeah. for people to read um benzodiazepines that does not make any sense to me why anyone would why that would help dissociation at all um it probably helps anxiety but i don't think it would help dissociation i think it actually worsens dissociation from my experience so yeah i, I yeah i think i think some authors have suggested it might be useful for patients who have concomitant anxiety but I, but i think 
it's a significant caveats so with using something like a benzodiazepine in terms of dependence and those kind of things. There's some, there's some again, case studies around um, the use of psychostimulants. Um, and it's possibly suggests that this might be useful for patients who experience kind of cognitive symptoms of the disorder, that kind of brain fog. Um, but again, the evidence isn't, ro isn't robust in any sense of the imagination. What I kind of point to in the article is actually if you're going to prescribe for this disorder, you are, it, it is kind of art as well as science, because like I said, there's no kind of algorithm I'm going to be able to give you, which says that this is what you should prescribe based on this robust evidence. And you have to be aware that potentially you might make things worse. So for example, the antidepressants may have often have side effects of depersonalization listed um indirectly some patients may become worse on certain medications due to other side effects so you know aripiprazole for example is something that's commonly used on the forums and obviously that's often associated with things like agitation and anxiety the same with naltrexone actually the same with levotrigine so you may make uh underlying depersonalization worse due to that mechanism and the final thing is that actually some medications when you withdraw from them the benzodiazepines, the antidepressants, the mood stabilizers, that sometimes people can experience depersonalization as a result of um, a withdrawal phenomena. So I think we should be honest with our service users and saying that if we are going to prescribe, we're prescribing on very thin evidence and that actually there's a potential that we might make things worse. Um, so I think there needs to be an open and candid discussion with your service user before initiating any medication. One one hundred percent, yeah. Especially like so with um, aripiprazole, you can get akathisia, which is restlessness. Um, so you have to watch out for that. You don't want to add another issue on top of their depersonalization. Um, I've had some patients who de describe something like depersonalization after getting off of antidepressants. So it's not just putting medications on, but it can actually be taking it off. How long does it last? It depends, would be my answer. Um, but yeah, we don't want to add a medication, have it do nothing, and then not stop it before considering a different one. So if you are going to try a medication, my recommendation is try it, give it a trial period, know how long the trial period should be based on the medication. And then... Um, if it doesn't work, get them off of it before you start something else. Because the last thing you want to do is just start doing polypharm on someone like this. And I imagine yeah, I in the forums, involved. you see a lot of people where that's the case, right? They're like on four medications and they're like, I'm not better yet. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Or I'm worse. Or I'm worse. Yeah. And then they have uh, the withdrawal effect, you know, as well. Cause a lot of the times, they don't know how to get off the medication. Providers are nervous to get people off of medications if it's working a little bit. But in my in my research yeah. and kind of for uh, setting up the depersonalization guidance center, the the business I operate um, under, I, I actually spoke to people online, um, just kind of offering you know a conversation with them really, and I spoke to one lady uh, from the US, and actually her descent into depersonalization derealization disorder was when she was she stopped venlafaxine abruptly obviously venlafaxine very short half-life known for its kind of withdrawal effects and then she had this kind of strange dissociative experience on it which she became fixated on and then it kind of stuck so her vehicle into the disorder was through medication or at least coming off it inappropriately uh, which I found very interesting. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Um, sometimes, sometimes people, people especially, have been on it for a long time. They need to get off very slowly. They need to do lifestyle things as well. Like if, if someone comes to me and they want to get off medications, I'm like, how can we optimize your exercise, your diet, stuff like that, to treat the underlying things that you need treated therapy things like that okay right. so final thoughts any final thoughts on this 
Yeah, so I mean, look, I I, I think um, a lot of people are going to be uh, inexperienced with kind of treating this disorder or inexperienced even with recognizing this disorder, despite the fact that it's incredibly common, especially within the population that you're likely to to come across. If even if you don't feel confident in treating the disorder, I think there is something very simple that can be done which is simply normalizing this symptom and that patients will often present to you highly anxious about what's going on for them highly anxious about you know whether this thing is going to go away um and actually just simply some soothing words of normalization that actually this is part of the human experience it's often associated with things like you know fatigue with stress with panic with with substance use um that can be very comforting for people to hear and it may even be very comforting to actually establish a diagnosis with somebody that you're actually expressing that this is a well understood condition with a, a clear diagnostic framework um, um for it um and i think then the very final thing is that actually a lot of people because this isn't kind of a, a very well-known disorder like something like I don't know, panic disorder or major depression, people are going on forums, getting all kinds of mixed messages about things, and getting very worked up about it. I think us as clinicians should point to the possibility of recovery. I'm obviously pleased to say that I've recovered, and I'm happy to share my recovery story. And there is plenty of other recovery stories online that you'll be able to find on YouTube and um, that you can point um, point people towards. So I think we're trying to normalize this condition, normalize the experience of de depersonalization and derealization as part of the normal human experience. But I think we should also be trying to normalize recovery, that recovery is very possible um, and that we can point to several recovery stories. And like I said, I'm more than happy to add my uh, my story to the to the list. I had um, one college student, I'll, I'll change a couple of the demographic factors just to hide the identity, of course, but college student, female, was at a party, was given what she thought was a LSD eye drop, put it in her eye, and started just in this incredible depersonalization experience. Incredible panic. And then it kind of continued where she was wandering around college now just completely like in this like haze. Um, it turns out it wasn't even LSD. Mm -hmm. They had given her just a normal eye drop and then told her that it was LSD. And then they were all laughing at her when she was like tripping out and she didn't realize why they were laughing at her. So that was part of the horribleness of the experience. Right. And, um, she comes to me and we did about five therapy sessions in a row going back to the memory, talking about how off, you know, empathizing with her experience, looking at the, all the different thoughts, hot thoughts, different, different things going on. And then um, expressing anger towards the inhumanity of being treated that way. And, and then she snapped out of it. That was it. She started like, she came back a month later, completely normal. And, um, you know, so sometimes it doesn't take a long journey, you know, as, as a, if you're a mental health professional, listen to this, hopefully this gives you enough tools to listen to someone's story. Don't let them just fall through the cracks and go months without treatment, you know, try to get them in sooner than later because it's very it can be very distressing um and then you know exercise both strength training and cardio may have a role as you've kind of heard in this episode it had a role in in um paul's journey so um yeah and i i love i love your idea that you've brought forth of this kind of like what is the meaning that we're attributing to this to the symptom and how do we change the meaning you know so how do we change the meaning maybe from like this like catastrophic this is going to be with me forever 
worst case scenario, which Facebook and all the forms may have like amplified, right? To, you know, I've had some dissociation in my life. I'm a more sensitive person. I'm more empathic. That's a superpower. I'm higher openness. That's a superpower. I'm a creative person. And because of that, I have this propensity to dissociate from time to time. And I'm kind of stuck in it because I went through a really stressful time and because I've been catastrophizing it. So I'm going to stop catastrophizing it and I'm going to adopt a different narrative, get some help, talk to someone and um, see if I can work through it. I think it's very helpful, hopeful, hopeful uh, plan. So man, this was great. Paul, we are going to have to have you back. I, th- I, th- I talked about maybe co-interviewing someone who wrote, wrote a book on this together. Hundred um, percent. Yeah, that'd be fun. And um, yeah, any final closing thoughts? No, I think we've covered everything there. Again, just to say, recovery is possible. You know, I'm one of many, and I hope uh, we can get more recovery stories. Uh, recovery stories out there. Yep. So if you're listening to this, you can reach out to Paul. Um, I'll put up. I'll- you know, this article on my website, psychiatrypodcast.com. And if you go there, you can see all the links to his websites and stuff. And we will leave it there for today.